resurrection, he has brought life to our world of death in a way that obedience to the law could never have accomplished. We share in his life by grace, not by anything we could possibly earn or achieve, merely by our own ability. We must now use our freedom as human persons to take up our crosses so that we may unite ourselves to Christ in his great self-offering for the salvation of the world. It is only by dying to the old ways of death that we may live as his new creation. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Let us continue to celebrate the birth of the Theotokos as a foreshadowing sign that his gracious mercy extends to all who respond to him with humble faith. And that is not a matter of legal observance. It's a matter of embracing personally the great victory over sin and death that the God-man, the second Adam, has worked for us through his cross for the salvation of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. You have been listening to Eastern Christian Insights with Father Philip Lemasters. Homilies from St. Luke Orthodox Church in Abilene, Texas. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. Boldly proclaiming the truth of the risen Christ, this is Ancient Faith Radio. Timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. Search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the gospel. This is Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855 855- 237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments that trampling down all carnal desires we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well-pleasing to thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father who is from everlasting, and thine all holy and good and life-giving Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Christos Anesti, Christ is risen. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantino, and this is Search the Scriptures Live. Today's date is May 23rd, 2022, and we're continuing our discussion of the resurrection. This is going to be the last uh, discussion of the resurrection, at least for now. Next Monday, for the next two Mondays, there's no live show. Then I will return live, but we will be talking about Pentecost because that will be the Monday of the Holy Spirit. So I thought it would be good for us to talk about Pentecost on that day. Then after that, well, I have ideas. I think I I can't remember if I told you yet what I think we're going to be doing when we return. But um, at any rate, we will embark on new studies afterwards, beginning in the summertime. So for our last little lesson on this of this series on the resurrection, we're going to talk about the oldest written account of the resurrection. This is actually older than the gospel accounts, and you should know where to find this. I wonder if you know which is the oldest written account. We always have to add the word written because the first account was by the mirror bearers when they found the empty tomb. By the way, if you want to call us tonight, I always forget. I always forget to announce the number. You do hear it, but here it is again in case you want to call with your questions or comments. The number is 855-237-2346. I have it right in front of me, but 
I get so focused on what I'm going to say that I always forget to announce it. So 855-237-2346, 855-AF-RADIO. So the, the oldest account, the oldest telling about the resurrection was on that day, on Easter Sunday, when the ladies uh, found the empty tomb, right? And the men ran down there and they looked for the body of the Lord. It wasn't there. And then he began to appear to people. So I'm speaking with a lot of precision here. I just want you to understand that. So it's not the oldest account, but the oldest written account of, that we have anyhow. There might have been others, but they have not survived. Remember, not everything from antiquity survived. As a matter of fact, most of the writings that existed during the first century during in what we call antiquity did not have not survived today. We think scholars estimate people who study this type of thing estimate that we have only 10% of the books that existed at the time. So this is why this whole idea, well, if it's not written down someplace, you can't believe it. You know, th that's nonsense because most writings from antiquity have not survived until today. They don't exist any longer. And there's reason, the destruction of cities, the Persian invasions, the conquest of Rome, things like this. So on some ancient documents exist in only one copy and uh, others in just a handful of copies. So um, it just, it wasn't, it, it's the kind of, the amount of writing wasn't available. And then only things that were very, very um, well known and very important existed in many, many copies. And um, so a lot of things we know existed because they are mentioned. So this is how I'm telling you. How do we know that these books once existed and no longer exist? Because other authors talk about them. I was reading in such and such a history. Well, it would be great if we had that history, but we don't have it anymore. Or we'll say in the letter of so-and-so to so-and-so, well, that would be great if we have that. Oh, on the count of this martyrdom, this it, sa it says this. Well, we don't have it anymore. So this whole idea that we have as Westerners, that everything has to be written down and subject to some kind of historical or scientific verifiable proof, is just a fallacy. This is a new thing. This is a very modern notion. Get over it. Okay, that's not how people lived for most of humankind's existence, relying on some word to back up what they believe. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a real problem if you, if you insist on this and you're trying to study the Bible or looking to, for have, to have faith in God. God didn't give us written proofs of anything. Anyhow, so the oldest written account of the resurrection appearances, where can that be found? Have you figured it out yet? Do you know? It is in one of the epistles of St. Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where St. Paul relates for us the earliest oral tradition about the resurrection appearances, and it has some very interesting characteristics and some very interesting details. It is extremely important from a historical point of view. So why is it that St. Paul's Epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the first epistle, is the oldest written account and not something like Matthew or Mark or something like that. Because, at least this is the theory, that the Gospels were not written before the epistles of Paul. The theory, none of these things are dated, by the way. So these are all dependent upon sort of analysis and people give their ideas about when the Gospels were written. The consensus is that the Gospels were not written right away, that they were written at some point later, maybe in the 50s or the 60s. Many people say 70s and 80s. We don't really know. It's kind of a guess, but it's very, very, very unlikely that the apostles sat down and wrote Gospels in the 30s and 40s. I think that's pr a pretty much a given that that didn't happen. Why not? Because they're busy traveling and preaching and they didn't there are three reasons first of all they did they they were busy preaching spreading the word orally that's how people got information not by writing that's number one primarily because writing was considered less reliable than oral testimony okay and that continued for a long time after the death of all of the apostles they didn't trust writing because writing could be altered 
it could be changed because everything was hand copied. So this idea that they must have written it right away, they just didn't feel the urgency. Then the probably the fourth reason would be, again, they thought that the Lord was coming back very soon. They didn't feel the urgency to write down their experiences with the Lord in what we would call today the Gospels because they thought he was coming back any moment. So, you know, he did say that he would return, but when he would return, that we don't know. And But they had this very strong um, passion and urgency in the early church to spread the gospel, and that was considered best done by oral transmission. And that's because that's how people learned. They went to school, and they sat down at the feet of their teacher, and they listened. That's how people learn. Can you imagine? Because today we're so... We, 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 we have lost the ability to focus. We're so easily distracted and we've trained our brains to be distracted. And we think that somehow it's great when we can multifunction. And you know what multifunction means? Multifunction means you're distra distracted and you're not really doing anything very well. That's actually true. That's been proven by psychological tests. So People in those days, they sat down and they really focused when they were listening to someone and they had techniques to memorize things. This is how people learned. They didn't have a textbook. There was no New Testament. They didn't sit there and take notes when P Paul preached or something like that. That just didn't happen. So the apostles wrote the Gospels later. All right. So the earliest parts of the New Testament are probably the epistles of Paul. And when it comes to the Corinthian correspondence, we can actually date that pretty well. So we did speak about this when we did our overview of the New Testament, but I will remind you that Corinth is very important when it comes to our study of St. Paul and dating his epistles because we know exactly when Paul was in Corinth because of certain references in the book of Acts and archaeological discoveries that have been made about people who were in Corinth and events and things like this. So uh, I'm not going to repeat that here because we'll just get a little, I'm already a little bit um, off track here. So we know that St. Paul was in Corinth between the year 50 and 52. That's our dating. The Romans had their own dating. So between 50 and 52. Then after he left, there was some kind of trouble in Corinth. The Corinthians were a real problem. They were a real handful for St. Paul. So 1 Corinthians would not have been written probably before 53, maybe more likely 54. Okay. So 1 Corinthians is written around the year 54, and he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ at the very, very end. Okay. Now, so oral tradition was very important, far more important than writing, far superior than writing. And this is something that we have to accept if we're going to be able to properly understand the New Testament and frankly, the limitations of the New Testament. Okay, because actually somebody wrote to me today and asked me this question. And the question was, why do the apostles baptize in the name of Jesus? That's what the question, because in Acts, they'll say, believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we know that we baptize in the name of the Trinity. All Christians do. Why? Because that was actually the early practice. So what happens is because people don't know that the baptismal formula and the prayers that were said over the water and things like this was not uh, something that was passed along publicly, but was kept as a mystery, they assume that people were baptized in the name of Jesus. I baptize you in the name of Jesus. No, because we see at the end of Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, we, the apostles were told to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that is first century. Okay. Why doesn't Acts describe that? Because in Acts, they're not actually describing what happened in the course of the baptism. Acts does not give us the baptismal formula. Do you follow what I'm saying? And we know that many, many, many things were not committed to writing because they were sacred mysteries. And where do you know, how do we know this? Because people talk about it. And one of the people who talks about it is St. Basil the Great in his treatise on the Holy Spirit. He's the one who says many, many things that we receive from the apostles were not 
written down, sometimes because they were secrets and because this was a, this was a religion under persecution. And other times because the things were secret because they were precious and they weren't to be shared with just everybody. So there are a lot of reasons for this, but you have to recognize that if you, if you don't understand that many things were not written down that were absolutely critical in the life of the church, then you really cannot correctly understand the New Testament or you're going to misunderstand it. Okay. So in the beginning of the church, there was no New Testament. The church had the Jewish scriptures. So of course, this calls into question the whole concept uh, that is very common among Protestants of sola scriptura. The church didn't operate that way, that if something isn't found in writing, we can't do it or we can't believe it or we can't say it. So uh, how is it that we have 1 Corinthians 15, which is the earliest written account of the resurrection appearances of Christ, and what he's actually giving us is the oral teaching in writing, okay? Why is that? And the, what, see, this is, I think, very fascinating. I hope you find it fascinating. We have this testimony by accident. Yes, by accident. Thanks to those misbehaving Corinthians. Thank you very much, misbehaving Corinthians, because, you know, 1 Corinthians as a, as a book, they had a lot of problems. St. Paul almost doesn't know where to begin. They had a lot of problems, a lot of issues. There are at least 10 different issues or problems in the Corinthian community that St. Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians. So just because they were Christians in the early era of the church didn't mean that they were without fault, that they didn't have problems, that they were all holy, that they're all saints. No, of course, they had a lot of problems and they made a lot of mistakes and they were doing a lot of things wrong. That's why St. Paul writes to them this epistle, this letter that we call 1 Corinthians. And he already taught them about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's not writing this to tell them about it. This is the other thing that's amazing to me that people say, well, you know, St. Paul preached, d didn't really talk too much about Jesus. What are you talking about? Of course he talked about Jesus. Why does he write these epistles? He's already formed them. He's already catechized them. He's already told them everything that the apostles used to teach. That was all done orally. But when he would hear that there was a problem or an issue or a matter of concern, this is when he would write a letter to address that specific little problem. Well, the, for, the, for the Corinthians, there are at least 10 problems, at least 10 like they were eating food offered to idols. They were quarreling. That's the first thing we hear about. They were quarreling amongst themselves, each claiming different groups, claiming to have superior wisdom. They were suing each other in court. One man was living with his stepmother as though she were his wife. Uh, there was questions about marriage and divorce and whether should, you should get married at all. And a whole host of things. Women um, prophesizing and how the people, uh, women sort of out of control in the services people getting drunk at the services. Um, the problem was not that women were prophesizing, but how they were, how the services were being conducted, people all talking at once at the same time. You can go back and listen to that lesson on 1 Corinthians, those lessons, and as we went through the, those, and I explained all of this to you. So this is not a community that didn't know about the resurrection. So why is St. Paul reminding them about it? So we're going to read through that, and we're going to talk about it verse by verse, or at least section by section, because, because they were actually thinking that they were so smart. Remember, these are the people who say, well, we have the superior wisdom. You know, and this is why St. Paul talks about wisdom versus foolishness, that human wisdom is not something we should be proud of because it's, it's foolishness to God and that we are saved by the foolishness of what we preach. That's what St. Paul says, and he brings up the cross very early in 1 Corinthians. They were very proud of their wisdom, and this means that they thought that they knew better. So they had, uh, or at least some of the Corinthians had come to the conclusion that there will be no resurrection of the dead. Okay, so 
it's not so much that they doubted Christ's resurrection. They doubted the um, science, what we would call scientific ability for the body to be raised. It's, it's Greek science. It's the science of the day. Okay. But they doubted that. So he reminds them of what, how they accepted the resurrection and how important it is, and then lists these various witnesses. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But this is, First Corinthians is an extremely valuable epistle because we learn a lot about the life of the primitive church. Clearly not every congregation was like this, but it does give us a little window into some of the things that were going on in these earliest, the primitive Christian congregations. So he's going to remind them of what they were taught, and then he goes on to explain it. And for him, it's not enough for them to believe, even if they believe that Christ rose, they have to believe that they will rise. But he's, they say, well, there is no resurrection. Now, I will go ahead and explain this to you so that when you, you'll understand why they felt that way. Um, ancient Greeks, the ancient Greeks, in their approach to science, some the kind of widespread idea about the world was that everything that exists is comprised of four elements, okay? Everything that you can see is comprised of four elements, and it was different combinations of these things. So the elements are earth, fire, air, and water, all right? So they thought that whatever you see, including the human body, every single thing is composed of different combinations, like a recipe of these different elements, okay? So when a person died and the body uh, dissolved back into the earth, it returned back to those original elements. You went back to being water, earth, air, or fire. So they thought it was impossible, scientifically speaking. That's Greek science, okay, of the time. That, not everybody believed that. And because, believe me, there were a lot of things that the Greeks knew about that are just mind-blowing, like atoms and things like this, that the, that this, the earth revolves around the sun. They could measure, they knew the circumference of the earth and things like this. So don't think that they were all ignoramuses because they were pretty intelligent about a lot of things. But this was kind of standard belief, all right? So when you died, your body dissolves, uh, decays, it goes back to those substances, and it was impossible to reconstitute it. That's what these Corinthians believe, and a lot of people were arguing. Now, there was a different argument from a, a sort of a philosophical perspective, and that was that why would you want to come back to a body? That's more based on their philosophy, the philosophy being that the soul is superior to the body, the body is just a hindrance to the soul, the body is like a prison for the soul, the body gets sick, the body, uh, you get old, you get tired, you need to be fed, you need to rest. So the body is a disadvantage. So when you died, your soul was liberated from the confines of the body. So why would you want to go back to the body? So that's a different argument. That's kind of a philosophical argument. That's what Paul encountered in Athens, okay? But we will come to that if I stop talking when we get onto the passage. So first I'm going to read for you the first 11 verses of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. So this is his, by the way, this is his closing. This is his last big argument. He's talked about nine different problems that they're facing. And this is the last thing he brings up because it's the most important. He wants to end with his discussion of the resurrection. St. Paul, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he was seen by Cephas, then the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. 
Then last of all he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, let's start with the first two verses when he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you. The gospel, of course, is the good news. That's the whole thing. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about salvation. The gospel is our salvation. That's what I preached, which you also received in which you stand. He's reminding them that this is what he preached to them. And they said they received it. They, they received it. They were baptized. They accepted it. You're standing on the gospel this, on which you stand, he says, by which you are being saved. It's not past tense. It is the progressive. It is they are being saved if you hold fast that word which I preach to you. Notice the condition. They won't be saved if they discard that word that he preached to them. Unless you believed in vain. What does that mean in vain? It means useless, of no account. So they are, yes, he says you are saved. You stand in this. You are saved by which you are being saved. You are saved if, if, if. So there's no such thing as once saved, always saved here. They will be saved if they continue to hold fast to these doctrines. Think about that. That's non-negotiable. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a dogma, and it's non-negotiable. Okay? So, yes, Christ died for us. We are saved, but we're being saved if we hold fast to the word. Okay? So his point is that it's not a done deal. You have to continue to maintain the apostolic faith. Otherwise, your faith is in vain. That means it's pointless. It's to no purpose. It is absolutely useless. So in verse 3, he says, now he goes on to talk about, because he's leading up to this eyewitness account. We haven't reached that yet. Listen to this, verse 3. For I delivered to you, I handed on to you, First of all, or of first importance, that which I also received. Now, this word I delivered to you or handed on to you is the Greek word tradition. Now, that word is not, the word tradition is not a verb in English. We can't say I traditioned to you. You can say I gave you this tradition, but there's no, but in Greek, the word tradition is both a noun and a verb. So he says, I tradition to you. I pass this on to you as of primary importance, as the most important thing ever that I received. It says here, and I, I have a note to myself, that the Orthodox Bi Bi Study Bible says that Paul received this as a personal revelation. That's not true. Not true at all. Because he says what I also received. Okay? That means Paul himself was catechized. He wasn't a follower of Jesus Christ. He persecuted the church. He talks about that in this chapter. So how did he learn about Jesus Christ? Once he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and had spent three days blind and praying and he was healed, he became a follower of Christ and he was catechized. He learned these things. He was taught these things by those who were apostles before him. So to, to tradition something, tradition means that you pass along what you receive. That's exactly what tradition is. You receive something and you pass it along. So he's saying that he received this when he was catechized and he passed this along. <clears throat> so now we're at the 30 minute mark. So let's take a little break right now. And when we return, we will continue and we will talk about what St. Paul received about what the oral tradition about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which he received as a catechumen. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. 
The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. So here's a question for you. What does it mean to think orthodox? What are the unspoken and unexplored premises and presumptions underlying what Christians believe? Orthodox Christianity is based on preserving the mind of the early church, its thronima. Dr. Jeannie Constantino brings her more than 40 years experience as a professor, Bible teacher, and speaker to bear in explaining what the Orthodox phronema is, how it can be acquired, and how that phronema is expressed in true Orthodox theology, as practiced by those who are properly qualified by both training and a deep relationship with Christ. Thinking Orthodox, now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Okay, so here is what St. Paul said to them. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This is what he's writing to the Corinthians. So now he's make, making the point that this is the most important thing that they were taught, the resurrection, because everything depends upon that. Otherwise, what is the gospel? The gospel is just not that Jesus died on the cross, you know, paid the price for our sins or something like that. It's that we have the opportunity to have eternal life because he conquered death. That's why the resurrection is so important. That's why we don't focus on that, you know, payment of sins and that kind of a thing. It's it's all about the resurrection. It's about what does this mean for me? And it is the opportunity for eternal life. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. That, now, it has been noted by Bible scholars, and I think it is true, that Paul is making a list here. This was an early kind of creed. Before the Nicene Creed, which is what we use today in church, there were other creeds. There were statements that were sort of formal statements that people memorized so that they could say what they believed uh, prior to being baptized. So this reads like one of those early creeds, and I'm, it reads like a list. And he re recites it the way you would be able to recite the creed without thinking about it. You know, you you would you would be able to recite anything that you have to memorize for, let's say, a professional um, examination to get a to get a certification of some kind. You can rattle off. Uh, I can still remember things from law school. I can remember the the formulas that we had to memorize in law school. What 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 we could say elements constitutes different kinds of crimes. We had to memorize that. Okay, so I can still remember those things. So this is what they were taught. They just didn't say, hey, let's talk about Jesus. Well, he was really great, and he told us to love each other, and he healed a bunch of people. This was, it was it had a lot of content in it, and they were expected to memorize it. And what Paul is reciting here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is something that's perfectly and completely familiar to them. They all know it. They all learned it. They all said, yes, we believe that, and then they were baptized. Okay, so here it is excuse me, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. I'm going to stop there because he added himself to the list. We'll talk about Paul later, okay? But that's that's the creed. That was the early Christian witness about the appearance of Christ because really he did not appear to Paul in the in the flesh. Paul just wants to be part of the list. So he adds himself there. We'll talk about that. But look at how 
This really sounds like a list. That means it was memorized. It was a form of early a primitive creed. Okay. The first thing he says is that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. What does that mean? In accordance with the scriptures. That means that it was fulfillment of prophecy. Okay. So he, St. John Chrysostom notes that Paul begins by affirming that Christ truly died. He was human. He had a body of his own. And of course, Chrysostom was responding to some of these heresies, but these heresies arose not too long after the time of the apostles. Heresies like Manichaeanism and Docetism and Gnosticism was when they were denying the physical body of Jesus Christ. So he says he died. Well, you can't die if you don't have a body. So Chrysostom is, uses this, of course, to argue against these heresies. So that he died uh, for us and was according to the scriptures that this was, it was foretold in the scriptures that the Messiah would die. Okay, this was fulfillment of prophecy. That he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. So, of course, he was buried. All right. This because he was a, he had a body. And that's what you do with a dead body. You bury it. So we've been talking a little bit about some of the people who helped with the burial of Jesus Christ, no, namely uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And you, you see the Christians all knew these stories. Then these were probably people who were known in the early church. So, of course, he doesn't say add them to the creed, but here you could see the essentials of what was taught to these people and what they accepted is here. He was buried. He rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. Also, that that was fulfillment of prophecy. So when we read according to the scriptures, we're thinking, well, it's in the New Testament, right? When we, where are we going to find it in the scriptures? Well, we're going to find it at the end of the Gospels where it describes the resurrection. But there are no Gospels. At the time that Paul is writing this to the Corinthians, he, he's not referring to New Testament because there is no New Testament. There are only the Jewish scriptures. Those are the scriptures of the church. So he's saying that this was something that was a fulfillment of prophecy. Now he begins to list the resurrection appearances. So he begins with the death and the burial of the Lord. And now he lists the people to whom he appears. And that he was seen by Cephas or Kephas um, in Greek. In English, we, we usually say Cephas, but that's the Aramaic name of St. Peter. So this is a very interesting thing because this is not described in the Gospels. St. John Chrysostom says it would be, it was appropriate for him to appear to Peter first because Peter was the first person to uh, recognize him as, as the Messiah. Remember, Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so he confessed him. He confessed who Christ was. And also, of course, he had denied him and he wanted to comfort Peter after the denial, which was quite devastating to St. Peter. So, so he was seen first by Cephas or Peter, then by the 12. Now, it would have been the 11 because Judas wasn't with them, but technically they were still the 12, even though Judas was no longer in the picture. Then he was seen by over 500 brethren, brethren at once, the greater of whom remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So this is one of the most intriguing details of this particular passage. Now, this appearance to St. Peter, which isn't described in any of the Gospels, is at least mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, you know the story of the road to Emmaus. We talked about that last time, that after the Lord appeared to those disciples, they returned. Immediately they got up after, he, after they saw the Lord after the breaking of the bread. They got up and they returned to Jerusalem. They went to the upper room and they said, we've seen the Lord. And they said, yes, the Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Peter. So that little statement there is at least mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. But this, this next one, and then it says, appears to the 12. 
Well, that's in the upper room. We have that in Luke, and we also have that in uh, in John, in John's gospel. But this little statement is so intriguing in verse 6 that he appeared to 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep, meaning some have died. This is not recorded anywhere else. And that just shows you how important was this. It was incredibly important. Don't you wish that we knew more about this? We have no idea who was there, when this happened, what were the circumstances, why were there 500 brothers? We're talking about 500 leaders, 500 Christians, 500 together at one place, and the Lord was suddenly among them. They saw the risen Lord in the body. We don't know anything at all about this appearance except that it happened. Because St. Paul not only tells us it happened, but every Christian knew about this appearance. The Corinthians weren't in the Holy Land. They never knew the Lord before he died. They never saw him alive again in the body. This is part of their catechism. And not only that, theirs, but everyone's. What I want you to understand is that this was standard catechism. St. Paul didn't make up this list. He said this is what he received. That's very important. Because this is what all of the apostles taught. They were consistent in what they taught, what they preached, when they brought people to faith in Jesus Christ. They all learned about this. So this appearance of the 500 was widely known in the early church. Everybody knew about it, and they would have known the details, just like we know about some of these other ones, like what happened when he appeared to the 12 in the upper room and and they were afraid and they thought they saw a ghost or later Thomas wasn't there. Then later Thomas came and what happened? Those appearances, we know details about what happened in the from the Gospels. But this one, we don't know anything else about. What does that tell you about the importance of oral testimony? That it was considered more important than written testimony, because if it was critical to write everything down, certainly somebody would have written down what happened here, or maybe they did. And like I said, when I began this podcast, maybe the those particular writings that did describe this were lost, but it's not in the four gospels. Sure isn't. I sure wish I knew what happened, but we don't know. Now, Paul says, he was seen by 500 brethren at once, most of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. So some fallen asleep, first of all, is the way that we're referencing um, death. Uh, just like Jesus says about Lazarus, Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going to wake him up. And the disciples say, yeah, that's good. If he fell asleep, it means he's going to recover. No, Lazarus has died. Okay. So Fallen asleep is the reason the reason why we as Orthodox Christians like to say so-and-so has fallen asleep in the Lord is because this is the ancient Christian tradition. That's how we speak about death. So um, so he says that they are most of the people who witnessed the Lord who were part of this group of 500, they're still alive. Most of them are still alive. Why? Because this letter was written in the year 53 or 54 at the latest. And so this is about 20 years after the resurrection of Christ. So most of the eyewitnesses to the bodily resurrection of Christ are still alive. And they were traveling around. They were called apostles. The term apostle was not restricted only to the 12. The 12 were called the 12. That's why Paul calls them the 12. And if you read the Gospels carefully and you read the Epistles of Paul and, and Book of Acts, they call the 12, the 12, not the apostles. The apostles is a much bigger number. The apostles were people who were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. And they were they went out to become his witnesses throughout the world. So there were many, many more than 12 eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There were at least 500, probably more. Here's why. Because as he continues, and why does he say some of them have fallen asleep? Because if most of them are alive, you can ask them, 
as they're traveling around, certainly they would come through Corinth, which was a pretty busy place. It's not some little out of the way corner of the Roman Empire. They would certainly come through Corinth. And you can ask them about the time that Jesus appeared to the 500. That's why Paul is reminding them of that. So verse 7, after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. So here, too, are two appearances we don't know anything about. James, which James would that have been? Probably James, the brother of the Lord, the head of the church of Jerusalem, Jesus's stepbrother. He appeared to James. Again, we don't know anything about that. Where was James? What did the Lord say to him? Why did he appear to him? What did James say back? What, you know, we don't know anything about that. But this was standard catechism of the primitive church. Everybody knew about that appearance and they knew the details about it. And then the last thing St. Paul says here is, then he was seen by all the apostles. Remember, I just said the apostles are not the 12. He already mentioned the 12 before. And the, uh, the apostles are not the 500. The apostles must be a larger number than just the 500, you see? So all the apostles, that's a pretty big number. So Jesus was seen alive again, not by three or four or one or two or a few hysterical women, but by, and not by 12, but by hundreds of people. So that's very, very important. So this is the oldest written account of the resurrection appearances of Christ. Now, what's missing from this? <laughs> what is missing? What do you think is missing? How about the women? What about the ladies? The discovery of the empty tomb or the appearance to Mary Magdalene or anything like that? Not mentioned. Not mentioned. Why not? Well, I did mention to you that the testimony of women was considered unreliable in Jewish circles. That's why the, the apostles don't believe them. You just didn't believe what a woman told you. That, that's, you, you know, you might say, yeah, but they're saints. St. Saint Paul is a saint and St. Peter and the, the 11 who are in the upper room and the women come and talk to them and tell them they've seen the Lord. And these are not strangers off the street. These are women that they knew who traveled with them. You know what? Sorry, <laughs> we're not going to believe you. Yeah, but they're saints. Well, you know what? They're still men of their time. You have to accept the fact that people are people of their time. You can't expect Paul to think like a 21st century American, Australian, a German, or, you know, a Frenchman or Englishman, wherever you live. You can't expect him to think like anything other than a first century Jewish Christian. So even though he says in Christ, there is no male or female, on the other hand, in other ways, he conforms to the norms of his culture, and we shouldn't criticize him for that or any of the apostles for that. We do the same thing in a thousand ways that we don't recognize. We conform to the norms of our culture. We think we're nonconformists. We think we're not bound by cultural ideas, but we are. Okay, we do conform to notions that are common in our culture wherever we live. So I think. The reason, I think the Gospels, of course, being written later, are telling more of the story of what happened. So they include the discovery, of course, they're going to, how do we find out that Jesus rose at all? You have to start with the empty tomb, and you have the women, and then you have the appearances to the women. So I think that's the reason. But why not have the, the empty tomb or the appearances to the women as part of this list? Because I think the list is so ancient. It's, it is a Jewish list. It is something that was part of the primitive church, not part of, it was in Jerusalem they made this list. And under, we could say, as part of Jewish, uh, in part of, in, within a Jewish culture, in which was, would not have understood why you would possibly list women as witnesses, because that actually might discredit the witness 
when the church began, remember the church began in Jerusalem, and that's within a Jewish culture. You would never list female witnesses. They would say, well, we're not paying any, we're not going to listen to what you have to say if you're going to list women as witnesses. It wouldn't really matter that they also had male witnesses. This is what I think. And because that's how it began, this is this shows us the antiquity of this list of witnesses. I think it goes back to the primitive church in Jerusalem soon after the resurrection, very, very early. It was memorized by everyone, and it didn't really matter that they felt like, well, now that we're in the Greek areas where women are allowed to have more, where women's testimony is accepted, let's change the list. They didn't change the list, okay? because they didn't change things. They accepted that apostolic tradition. Think about that. Don't you see how powerful that is? To Just to give you an example of something sort of similar. Why is it that Matthew's gospel gives us the genealogy of Joseph? That's what he's doing. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob and his brothers, and, and Jacob began, you know, Judah and his brothers that sort of thing. And then it goes on to say, and so-and-so begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, from whom was born the Christ. And then it goes goes on to tell us that Joseph is not the father. It was inconceivable to them that anybody would give Mary's genealogy. Absolutely inconceivable. It just it, they, they would never have imagined that because be for, for again for cultural reasons. So I think we've done enough with this. So this is why he doesn't list the testimony of women because Paul didn't write the list, right? Paul has a lot of women who are co-workers of his. But he didn't write the list. So I see that we have a call from Mike. And uh, Mike's going to join us. Mike, where are you calling us from? Good evening, Presbyterio. Good Christ evening, Christos Anesti, Alithos Anesti. Welcome to Search the Scriptures <laughs> Live. You're Thank from you so Minneapolis, I see. Yeah, Minneapolis area, yeah. So I'm giving a call because this is such a small thing that you mentioned, and if this is just one of those micro things, please just tell me <laughs> so and I'll, I'll pass it by. But uh, you mentioned that Paul had been catechized. Yes. Uh, not, not that the gospel was received through Revelation. And so I, of course, pulled out the Orthodox Study Bible, and it sort of seems to suggest exactly what you're yeah. saying. That, or at least it was a mixture that there was, it's not clear whether it was revelation or catechesis. Um, but it, it tickled my brain. The, the comment reminded me of Galatians. I had to look it yes. up, Galatians 1.16, yes. yes. where it sort of seems to suggest he spent a long yes. time before he talked to any of the, uh, the, the uh, apostles. And so I, I pulled as many books as I could find before calling to see if there was a good answer. I, uh, I grabbed Father Farley's books on the Companion series, and he sort of lays out a timeline suggesting that the revelation on the road to Damascus was around 35 A.D., and that Paul's first trip to Jerusalem was 37 A.D. Again, this might be a small point, but I was just hoping you could maybe flesh out a little bit of that uh, idea that this was, this was catechesis and not revelation. So, okay, so you're saying that Father Farley says that Paul went to Jerusalem and met the apostles in 37? That is. Let me that's, just open that page of the book again. Yeah, he's got the chronology. That's not, 35 is the conversion of St. Paul, and yeah. 37, first visit to Peter uh, at Jerusalem, Galatians. But that, okay, I, 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 I haven't read any of Father Farley's books, so I, I, but I'll take your, your word for that. I don't mean to be disrespectful to him or anything, but in Galatians, it says, after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem. So I don't know how he's arriving at that, but that's really irrelevant to what we're talking about. So thanks for calling, first of all, Mike. <laughs> yeah, let's talk Thank about, let's, no, 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 you can, you can stay on unless you want to hang up. Okay. But you can stay okay. on if you want. Okay. So here's what's, and then you can ask me to clarify if, if I didn't make this clear. So, when we talk about being catechized, remember that the that St. Paul met the Lord on the road to Damascus, right? And so he found out about the Lord when he was immediately, when he was um, healed, right? He was healed, and then he was told about the Lord, and he was baptized. He had to be catechized. You don't think that they told him everything about Jesus Christ? Of course he was catechized. Do you see what I'm trying to okay. say? They had to tell him I about do, the do. resurrection. 
No, I know. I do not argue. I'm just explaining why I disagree with what it says there in the footnote of this particular passage in the Orthodox Study Bible. What this, this is different from Galatians, and it's different from 1 Corinthians 11. Okay. It does seem that St. Paul received certain private revelations from the Lord because he wasn't among the 12. And the Lord, of course, knew how important he was going to be. So he did receive certain private revelations. Now, I hope I don't have to say this. We do have a mostly Orthodox audience, but I just want to say, because of this, this is a little bit of a, this has nothing to do with your question. I'm just warning people. Because of this, some people think, oh, I can have private revelations of the Lord. I received this in a private revelation. This is where the whole idea of something like the rapture comes from, somebody claiming to have received a private revelation. This is extremely dangerous. And nobody should assume that they're getting private revelations from the Lord. It's kind of based on pride, but people get that idea from what we know about St. Paul. So I would caution anybody listening not to assume that you two are on the level of St. Paul so that you could receive a private revelation. That's not directed at you, Mike. It's just directed at anybody out there who might think that they could also be on that level, okay? So let's just, I just want to say that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he gives us the oldest written account of the Lord's Supper, he says he received it from the Lord. What I also handed on to you, it's almost exactly the same, but there he says, I received from the Lord what I handed on to you. You see? And then in Galatians, his he, there he's talking not about these rev- um resurrection appearances, but in Galatians, he's talking about how he came to understand that the law of Moses was no longer necessary and that he received this understanding from the Lord. And he did not receive it from human beings. His whole argument there is that this is not a human thing. That much later is when he went up to Jerusalem and met the apostles and shared with them that he had been baptizing the Gentiles and not insisting that they be circumcised or otherwise follow the law of Moses, and that he received that from the Lord, not from the apostles. Do you see my point? Are you still there? That's a, yeah, okay. I, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. That's a beautiful explanation. I really appreciate that clarification. Okay. Thanks. Yes, so it's, it, it is correct to say that he did receive private revelations, but the first one, 1 Corinthians 11, was about what happened at the Last Supper, since he wasn't there. And then in Galatians there, he's speaking specifically about how he came to the understanding that Gentile Christians don't have to follow the law of Moses. Then he explains how he met the apostles later. All right, this here I'm taking because he's reminding them about what he taught them and about what he also received. So here he's placing himself with the with the with the Corinthians as himself once also having been a catechumen, right? Or at least mm-hmm. being catechized after he was baptized. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay. Any other questions thank or comments? You. Just to thank you, I've been listening to your program for more than a decade now. You were one of the first things I listened to when I was first exploring the Orthodox Church, and I can't thank you enough for all your great work. Thank you very much, Michael. God bless you. Christ is risen. You as well. Thank you. And truly, he is risen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so now, after we're, we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to come back and talk about verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, and this is where St. Paul adds himself to the list. I kind of, I love the fact that he does this. When he says, last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of time. Sometimes they say born abnormally. And then he talks about himself as an apostle. All right. So we are going to go ahead and talk about that. And then what he says after this about the importance of the resurrection after our break. Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment. But the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO.
curious about the Orthodox Christian faith? Do you have questions about Orthodox Christianity that you can't trust strangers in internet forums to answer? Are you an Orthodox Christian looking for a reliable first place to send your interested friends? Do you need help finding an Orthodox church near you? My name is Father Paul Hodge. I serve in the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America. My name is Father Joseph Lucas. I serve in the Orthodox Church in America. My name is Father Anthony Cook. I serve in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. And I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick, Chief Content Officer of Ancient Faith Ministries and a priest of the Antiochian Archdiocese. And we're the Orthodox Intro Team. If you're looking for a first stop online to get an introduction to the Orthodox faith, a place to get answers to questions from qualified Orthodox Christian clergy, a place to send your friends and not just toss them into the chaos of the internet, a place to get help finding an Orthodox parish and get plugged into an actual Orthodox community, then point your web browser at orthodoxintro.org. Orthodoxintro.org is a free service of ancient faith ministries and made possible by our donors. It's an Orthodox on-ramp to the Christian life. Again, that's Orthodoxintro.org. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Okay, we're discussing St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15, about the resurrection. We won't get to most of the chapter where he talks about some very important things like, you know, Christ being the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Actually, we did cover this chapter when we did an overview of St. Paul. We discussed each of his epistles, and I discussed some of the key passages, and I remember that we did talk about chapter 15. So you can find that if you look, um, either uh, if you l listen, go to the AFR site to find Search the Scriptures Live, um, where you where you log in to listen to this program, it, it has uh, the past episodes. There's a place where you can click for the past episodes. I'm trying to remember what the button says now. It says, I think it says archives. That brings up all the past episodes, or you can go to orthodoxbiblestudy.info, not studies, not plural, orthodoxbiblestudy.info, and there, there is a, a site that lists, that posts all of the content, all of the old uh, Search the Scriptures podcast and all the new ones, including these live ones here. So um, there you can look, it, it's all on one page, which makes it very easy to find. So you can look to see where we talk about 1 Corinthians and the resurrection and listen to that if you're interested in that. So here is what St. Paul adds after he says, this is what we taught you. This is what you said you believed. This is the, the faith on which you stand. You said you received this. You said you believed it unless your faith was in vain. That, 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 that. He appeared to this and the guy and this one, this and this and this and this. And last of all, here's the part he adds. It's not part of the creed. He appeared, he was also seen by me as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, there's a lot we could say about this passage, but let's start off by talking about why does he say that he was born out of time, or sometimes it's translated as abnormally or out of due order or something like that. What, is, what, what does this mean? Why does he say that? Because he, was, he did not know the earthly Christ. He never met Jesus. And frankly, that was an absolute requirement to be considered an apostle. Remember, apostles are not just the 12. But the apostles were so important in the early church because they were the eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Never forget, that is the gospel. 
If anybody asks you what the gospel, don't just say that Jesus gospel is, don't just say that Jesus died on the cross for us. You got to add the resurrection every single time. That's what they did because that's what made you an apostle, not believing that Jesus died or that he died for us, but that you saw him alive again in the flesh after he had died. That's what qualified someone to be considered an apostle. And there were hundreds and hundreds of them, as we have already established. St. Paul was not among them, and that's why he had so much difficulty in his life that people said he wasn't really an apostle. That's what the Second Corinthians is all about. Frankly, that's what Galatians is about, too. People said you shouldn't be listening to Paul. You shouldn't have Paul as your spiritual father because Paul's not a real apostle. He never knew the earthly Jesus. So why was that considered so essential? Because the apostles were the witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, there were witnesses to his miracles and his teachings and everything else. But this is what the Lord says to them before the the ascension. And he says this on the... Uh, on the mountain at the end of chapter 28 of chapter of Matthew's gospel. He says this at the, in chapter 24 and in Luke's gospel, he says this in chapter one of the book of Acts, you are my witnesses to these things. So the apostles are the witnesses of the resurrection and Paul was not among them. And that's why I think he's a little brokenhearted that he wasn't among these eyewitnesses. He wasn't part of the band. He wasn't part of the group. And it disqualifies him from being an apostle. And he had to fight to be considered an apostle. And to, to until the day he died and probably afterwards, there were still people who did not consider St. Paul an apostle. And isn't that ironic? Because today, if you are reading any of the fathers of the church, and they are referring to some apostle without saying who it is. They say, as the apostle says, they're quoting St. Paul. Unless they're commenting like there's a commentary on the Gospel of John, then they might refer to the apostle being the person they're talking about. But if they're just giving a sermon and they say, according to the apostle, it's Paul. He became the apostle. And that's so ironic and it's so beautiful. Of course, well-deserved. But I'm trying to explain to you why Paul puts himself on the list because he also experienced the risen Christ. Of course, that's what changes him on the road to Damascus. That is what made him, that is what made him a follower of Jesus Christ, that experience on the road to Damascus. And then, of course, all the other things that happened to him afterwards, but that was it. That was a life-changing experience as, as much as seeing and touching the actual flesh of Jesus Christ was for all those other apostles. So he says, last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. And then he wants to be considered an apostle, but he says, I am the least of the apostles. And I think he really felt that way because he persecuted the church. And that, I think, never left him. The knowledge that he persecuted the church the knowledge that people were, that he arrested people, put them in jail. And we don't know what happened to those other people. We know that Stephen, he wasn't arrested by Paul, but Stephen was stoned to death with the approval of Saul. And then Saul went around arresting people, putting them in prison. What happened to them? Did they, were they also martyred? Very possible. We don't know. So he had to accept that. And he lived with that the way St. Peter lived for the rest of his life with the fact that he denied the Lord. Okay, so he accepts this. And what does Paul say in verse 10? By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, not wasted, not useless. But your faith is in vain if, I'm paraphrasing what St. Paul would say, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your faith is in vain. That's what he said to these Corinthians. Now, this is one of the most beautiful statements of St. Paul, that his grace toward me was not in vain. And, oh my gosh, St. John Chrysostom talks about this and talks about how the Lord 
molded St. Paul, what does it mean that his grace was not in vain? It was not wasted. It was not useless. The grace of God did not come on St. Paul, not just once, but repeatedly, and have it go to waste. Contrary to us, we receive the grace of God thousands of times, beginning with our baptism, even maybe before our baptism at Holy Communion. We receive the grace of God when at confession, when we pray, when we read the Bible. All of these things are opportunities to receive the grace of God. Does it change us? Have we become sanctified because of it? Are we different people every week? Are we becoming coming closer to Jesus Christ because of the grace of God? I would say no. But that's what happened with St. Paul. That's Chrysostom's point about this passage, and it is an unbelievable statement. You should, you should read it. I, I don't have time to read it. But his point is that this is what made St. Paul a saint, that whenever he received the grace of God, it wasn't in vain. He was changed. He was improved. And because of this, in other words, St. Paul responded to the grace of God in his life. And because of that, God gave him more grace. And because of that, God gave him more grace. So, of course, he has these revelations. Of course, he's a saint. He literally raised people from the dead. He, he healed people. I mean, these people are saints. Who are we to say, oh, I can receive revelations from Jesus Christ? Well, when you start raising people from the dead, maybe I'll pay attention, okay, to what you say. You have your own revelations. I've got this private revelation from Jesus Christ. There is so much arrogance in the Christian world because people think they can have private revelations like St. Paul, as if any of us are on his level. None of us are on his level. There isn't a saint alive. And by the way, St. John Chrysostom it was, thought he was the greatest saint who ever lived. And I explained that to you before, but we can't go there to explain to you why. Now, because I want to talk to you about the next verse, verse 11, St. Paul says, Therefore, whether it was I or they, speaking about the other apostles, so we preach in the present tense, so we preach. And so you believed. Now, what does that mean? So we preach. First of all, he's saying that what he teaches is consistent with what all the other apostles teach. They all teach, they all preach exactly the same thing. And what they preach is what he listed and, uh, and everything else. His testimony is the same as theirs, as the same as the other apostles. He's not teaching some other gospel. It's exactly the same, okay? And so he's saying that we are in, I'm in line with what those other apostles are saying. I'm not deviating from what the other apostles taught. And you said that you accepted this about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? So, so this, in other words, it's not that they accepted something Paul taught, but the others are not teaching this. It's exactly the same. And this is why that creed element was very important. Now, as St. Paul continues, he's going to make another point. Verse 12, now if Christ is preached that he rose from the dead, how is it that some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. And we are found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then all of us also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Now, if Christ is preached, so let's go back to the beginning. Then he goes on to talk about how if, if Christ hasn't risen, then we might as well just have, live it up and have a good time because there is no afterlife, right? There is nothing else to look forward to. We might as well just enjoy the pleasures of this life. 
we might as well do whatever we want. Why live a life of morality? Why be honest? Why why not cheat? Why not steal things? Why not why live a life of morality if there's nothing after this? Not not that that's the reason why we do it, but the point is, and he says it. We might as well say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. If if we have nothing to look forward to, then why are we doing any of this? So let's go back to the first thing he says. If Christ is preached, be preached, that he rose from the dead, why do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So this is, now he's asking them, this is what some of the Corinthians are saying. There is no resurrection. But you said you believe that. We all, all of these people that Paul listed are witnesses, eyewitnesses of the fact that they saw Jesus Christ alive again. Now, the Corinthians might say, that's fine, that's Jesus Christ, he's, the, he's God after all, right? They knew that, they believed that too, but we're not going to rise. Do you see? Do you see what they were saying? That's okay for Jesus. Jesus is God, but there's no resurrection of the dead. So part of this, I explained to you, has had to do with prevailing conceptions in their culture about science and also philosophical ideas. So first they thought that it was scientifically impossible for the body to be reconstituted. Okay. Then they would say things like, what about people who died at sea? And so you see little statements in books like Revelation where it says, and the sea gave up its dead, things like that. So what if they would come up with it? What if the person w- died in a fire and they were burnt up? So they came up with all these ideas of why resurrection was impossible, scientifically speaking, according to their ideas of science. Now, I also mentioned the Platonic philosophy. According to the prevailing philosophy at the time, you wouldn't want to go back to the body. So we see this with St. Paul in Athens when he is discussing Jesus Christ at the Areopagus, at the hill where the town council of Athens met. And people were interested in what he had to say about Christ until he mentioned the resurrection and everybody started laughing. And then he lost most of his audience because the idea was that nobody wants to come back to the body. The body is inferior to the soul. The soul is imprisoned in the body. You're waiting until you die so that your soul can be free. So, um, This is something that they thought was ridiculous. It was a ridiculous concept, the resurrection of the body. So St. Paul had to respond to that. And most of the people, he, as I said, most of the people in Athens who were listening to St. Paul, he said they were very open-minded. They loved to talk about the latest idea. This thing was just too much for them. So St. Paul is saying, if we preach that Christ is raised, why are some of you saying that there is no resurrection. Because if there is no resurrection, then Christ is not risen. In other words, he had a body too. That's kind of important. If it's impossible for you to rise, then it's impossible for Christ to have risen. Okay, then Christ also didn't rise. In other words, if if it's not possible, then Christ also did not rise. And if Christ did not rise, what are we doing? Our preaching is empty, and if your faith is empty, we're, we're wasting our time. All these hundreds of people who saw the Lord and left everything that they knew, left their lives behind to travel around the world and talk about the, the fact that they had seen the resurrection Christ, they're all liars, and it, all of this is futile and in vain. Because if the dead do not rise, then also that applies to Jesus Christ. If it's impossible, that applies to Jesus Christ also. If the dead don't rise, Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, you can see the reasoning here. It's a very sound reasoning. Your faith is in vain. You're still in your sins. Notice that the crucifixion is not enough. Now, you might have been thrown off by that early on when he says that Christ died for our sins. Yes, he died for our sins. But if Christ is not risen, your sins are not forgiven. Okay? Because this is what he says here. If Christ is not risen, you're still in your sins. That's verse 17. So again, it's not the idea of this transactional thing. Somebody had to pay the price. Yes, Christ died for us. He died for our sins. He died because of our sins, but he didn't stay in the grave. And because he didn't stay in the grave, we too can have eternal life. That's the point. If he didn't rise, you're still in your sins. What's the point of anything we do here? 
And also all the people who fell asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, all those people who died, for us especially, think of all the billions of Christians over the years who died with the hope of the resurrection. They're still in their sins. There, there's nothing for them. And then he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, of all the people in the world, the most pitiable. Why? If we only can have hope in Christ in this life, if this is all there is, we're the most to be pitied of anybody else because we've wasted our lives preaching about something that is impossible, that can't possibly be true. And he also says, if you're saying that um, you're, we're also false witnesses. He mentions that in verse 15. You're telling, you're calling us liars. You're saying we are false witnesses because we're saying that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, whom if the dead do not rise, this didn't happen. You're making us all to be liars. You're calling us all liars. So all of those people are not lying. Okay. And we are to be pitied if this is not true, because this is how we have spent our lives. Think of everything the apostles sacrificed to spread the gospel about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, that is a pity. If there is no such thing, we're to be more pitied than anybody else who ever lived because we've wasted our lives. So the resurrection is, of course, extremely important, but we have to understand that is important because for, for a lot of theological reasons also. It's not enough that the soul of Christ rose, but also the body. Okay, we have to affirm this in the same way, even though people today want to question it for other reasons, historical reasons or scientific reasons, without the resurrection, we have no faith. There is no hope. We must continually affirm that the whole person is sanctified by the grace of God. And whatever we receive, because Jesus Christ, the Logos, was incarnate, because the Son of God was incarnate, became a human person, he sanctified our human nature by, re by uniting it to his divinity. And everything we do in the church is for the sanctification of this body. That's why we're not supposed to sin in the body. That's why, uh, this isn't really spoken of very often, but sexual sins are especially bad because we're sinning against the body. Christ, uh, St. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians also. We're sin sinning against ourself, and we're defiling the body that was sanctified by baptism, by communion, and all these other things. We can't divorce ourselves from our body. We can't divorce our soul and our spiritual future from the body. Yes, but this is my girlfriend or my boyfriend, and I've been with him so long. And, you know, let's just, let's not bother to get married. We'll just live together. Whatever people, whatever excuses, but I have needs. And it's just like eating. You have sexual needs. It's just like eating. You have to fulfill that need. I mean, these are the excuses people give. But we have to recognize that this is a very serious thing. And St. Paul discusses that in 1 Corinthians, that we cannot uh, use our body, which has become a temple of the Holy Spirit, for immorality, because one day we will stand before that awesome judge, and we will have to account for ourselves and what we, our sins are not just in our minds. Sometimes as Christians, we tend to minimize our deeds and think more about our intentions. This is a very bad habit. The Jews do the opposite. The Jews are all about what you do. Okay, do you follow the law or not? Are you ritually pure or not? For us, we very often want to excuse ourselves by saying, well, I didn't really mean to hurt this person. I didn't mean to do this. I didn't mean to do that. And somehow that excuses us. So we have to be careful about that. We have to recognize that we will be held to account for all of our sins, not just the sins in our mind, in our heart, but also in the body. So because Adam and Eve didn't just sin in their souls, they sinned in the body. They ate the fruit. So the first thing was that they disobeyed the Lord. They listened, did not, they followed their own self-will. That was the beginning. But then they ate the fruit. That was a deed. And of course, because of this, they died, right? This was not just some rebellion in the mind. So the fall of mankind brought 
sin into the world and it affected all of us. It affects our minds. It affects our soul. It affects the body. You see, we have physical effects. We get ill. You know, we, we suffer pain. We die. All of these things are a consequence of the fall. So these things will also disappear in the resurrection, in the next life. And the body will be glorified. We will have that glorified body that the apostles experienced in Jesus Christ. Remember that it was nonetheless a physical body that was very important. So that's why he ate before them. They touched him, etc. Now, the body is going to be somehow different from what we have now because he passes through doors, but still, nonetheless, it was physical. What does this mean? We don't know. But we have to accept the fact that we uh, that the resurrection is absolutely critical. We should never deny the resurrection or cast doubts on it in the slightest way, because to deny that denies to deny Christ's resurrection also denies our resurrection. And then what's the point of being a Christian? Not because we're hoping for some like reward. We want to go to go to heaven. Yeah, don't you want to go to heaven? It's, it's not that that's some reward. The next life is not about enjoying some kind of paradise where we get to eat and drink and these kinds of things, but it's life, eternal life in union with God. That's why our beautiful prayers that we say at the memorial service are just so spectacular, where there is no sorrow or sighing or pain. All of those things will go away. There'll be just bliss, eternal joy and bliss, something that we can't comprehend who are on this earth but that union with God will be something beyond our comprehension, will be a joy that we can't even put into words. This is what we're anticipating and we hope to achieve when we too are raised. But we have to sanctify ourselves because we have to remember that just as Christ was raised, we too will be raised and we will be raised either to judgment of condemnation or we will be raised to eternal life. And this is extremely important. So everything we do on this life matters, whether in the body or out of the body, whether intentional or unintentional, as we see in our communion prayers. So with those last words, um, let us remember and say one last time, here Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And I will remind you that there will be no live program for the next two weeks, but we will return on June 13th. I'm pretty sure it's June 13th. Yes, it is June. June no, June 13th is, uh, let me make sure before we, before I give you the wrong date. It's a Monday, of course. It's the Monday of the Holy Spirit. Yes, June 13th, the Monday of the Holy Spirit. Join me again for the next live podcast. And I wish you all a beautiful evening. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. A light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. Alithos anesti, Ochidios. Truly the Lord is risen. Good night.